Hello, I'm David. Uh, this is a Maths 1A revision seminar. It's semester two, uh, 2021. Um, for you, you watching online um, in the future, hello from the past. I hope things are better there. Uh, it's had a pretty rough trot the last few years, um, but we're doing okay. And um, that's enough of that ridiculousness. Um, it's a Maths 1A revision seminar. And um, I've got some requests on the board behind me and we're going to see what we can get through. I want to remind everyone who is here that it is okay to interrupt me. Um, if you're interrupting me because I've put a minus in the wrong spot or done some other calculation area, interrupt me straight away, don't wait, okay? If you have a question about what I'm doing, maybe wait till the end of the sentence and then ask. Um, but it's your seminar, so just let me know what you want me to do, okay? So first I'm going to have a talk about Spans and linear independence and basis and that sort of thing. So, there are plenty of other seminars on the website already about this. Um, so, if you want more detail about what I'm about to say, then feel free to look at them. There's a really good one from about five years ago, six years ago maybe, um, that I'm very proud of. Um, I'm not gonna do the whole shebang because that one took two hours, So, um, but I will do a bit of it. So, okay. So the first thing I wanna say is that uh, mathematicians um, have things they call vectors which are not quite the same as what um, physicists call vectors. In physics, a vector is a quantity that has both magnitude and direction, famously quoted in Despicable Me. Um, but mathematicians don't think about vectors that way. To a mathematician, a vector is just something that you can add and do scalar multiplication on. So, and, and what that means is there's no such thing as a single vector. Vectors come in collections that live all together. So it's not so much that a single force is a vector, it's that all forces are vectors in physics. So vectors are things that do addition and scalar multiplication in a reasonable sort of way. Um, you have to be able to do the distributive law and expand, expand multiplications and add in any order you want and all those sorts of rules. And in Mass 1A, the only vectors you look at are points in Rn. So Rn is called a vector space which means it's made of things that all together I can do scalar multiplication and addition. And it's a vector space made of things with n coordinates. Um, I'm gonna call it points. With n coordinates. And you're allowed to write them as rows or you're allowed to write them as columns. When they're interacting with matrices, we almost always write them as columns, usually. So I specifically said points because to a mathematician, a vector like that set of coordinates, most of the time is representing a point in space, not an arrow. There are only arrows to help us imagine how the addition and scalar multiplication works. But for, for a just a set of coordinates all by itself not doing anything, it's a point. So that's one of the big ideas that's not particularly clear if you talk to someone about it, is that these can represent either points or arrows depending on what we're doing with them today. But if they're just sitting there by themselves, not adding or subtracting, they're points. And in fact, even if you do add or subtract or multiply them by scalars, whatever the answer is, is still a point. That's really important. So when we talk about sets of vectors, we mean sets of points.
sets of vectors in Rn are just sets of points. And when I say set, to a mathematician, a set is anything that has a rule for deciding if you're in or out. Um, it has to have a rule that doesn't have any contradictions. Um, you, you can't have a rule that contradicts itself because then you wouldn't be able to tell if some things were in or out. So as long as you have a consistent rule that tells you whether you're in the set or not in the set, then it's a set. Otherwise, it's not even a thing at all. Okay, and sets can be described. Um, sets can be, you can tell people about sets in multiple different ways. Um, you can tell people about sets either as you know, a list, just have a list of things that are definitely part of the set. And the things that are in the set are the things in the list and the things that aren't in the set are the things that aren't in the list. So your classic examples of that are, you know, zero, 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 one, zero, three, two, minus one, seven. That is a set that is inside R3. It's a set of three points. That's all it is just a list okay the next one is that you can have a type of thing and then a such that sign sometimes it's a colon um, and a rule that they have to satisfy so for example you could have um, x, y, z in R3 such that x minus y equals z. And this is the rule to decide if something is in the set or not. So you pick a random vector and you do the x coordinate minus y coordinate, and if that comes out the same answer as the z coordinate, then it's in this set. And if it doesn't, then it's not in this set. And the other kind of set uh, is. Um, Is written like this. It tells you how to construct it and then gives you some technical details about how to do it properly. So for example, it might have something like 2a b minus a 1 such that a and b are real numbers. Whoops, sorry about that. So these are the three main ways that you can tell someone what a set is. The curly brackets indicate this is a set. And these two notations look the same structurally. They've both got thing and then a such that sign and then a, a thing. But this one tells you a rule to decide if things are in the set or not. And this one how tells you how to make all the things in the set. And that's great. And there is one more way, which is just to draw a picture of it. Like any drawing whatsoever is a set. And you say, the things I've colored in are the set and the things I haven't colored in are not the set. Um, classic. So anything that you could possibly draw is a set. And the hope in most of mathematics, all the way back to Descartes when the Cartesian plane was invented, is that if you have a thing that you can, you've drawn or imagined, then it's possible to describe it in one of these ways. That's the hope. Cool. So the classic best sets that we love the most are straight lines and planes. They're, they're our favorite sets in, in linear algebra. And so um, favorite sets lines, planes, everything. Perfectly good set is, my rule for being in the set is everything's in the set. Aha, the set is everything. They're our favorite sets. So when someone asks you to describe a set, you need to say essentially what you would normally do to describe a drawing to somebody. So if you had a set and you, and you thought about it and said, oh, it's a line, then when they say describe the set, they mean say, it's a line. Or you might look at it and go, I've thought about this rule and everything satisfies this rule. This set is everything. That's the sort of thing that they want you to say. Everything doesn't sound fancy enough. You would say like the whole of Rn or whatever. 
So I'm going to do some examples, but that's the idea we're going for. Does that help? <laughs> yeah. So describe these sets is a really weird thing to say, but ultimately these are our favorite sets. Some other slightly less favorite sets are circles um, or squares, that sort of thing, you know. Circles are good ones. And you could say, ah, oh, it's the entire inside of this circle or it's the entire outside of this circle or something like that. But in, um, when we're talking spans, it's always going to be one of these things, lines, planes, those sorts of things. Okay, cool. That's just the preliminary stuff about the language and how the, how the notation works. And now let me talk about span and linear independence and that sort of thing. So the thing that vectors do that, that mathematicians um, allow themselves to call them vectors is that they do addition and scalar multiplication. And the act of taking some vectors and combining them with addition and scalar multiplication is called making a linear combination. So when you take vectors and you combine with addition and scalar multiplication, Damn it. Then that's called making a linear combination. So, for example, I would say that, for example, that one, three, seven is a linear combination of one, one, two, and zero, one, I'm going to say one, one, three, and zero, one, two, because when I do one of one, one, three, and two of zero, one, two, I get one plus zero, which is one, one plus two, which is three, and three plus four, which is seven. So because this can be made from those two using addition and scalar multiplication, this is called a linear combination of those vectors. Whoops, sorry. Right, because this can be made out of, this is made out of those two using a linear combination, using addition and scalar multiplication, it's called a linear combination. All right. So the actual definition in the book is something along the lines of A1, V1 plus A2, V2 plus dot, dot, dot plus AK, VK. And that's the, the symbol version of this, you know. You know, V3 is A1 times V1 plus A2 times V2, something like that. And in a textbook, these would be in bold. But on paper, I underline them to show that it's supposed to be in bold. Okay. So that's linear combinations. And linear combinations are everything because that's the whole point of what vectors are for. That's why mathematicians allow themselves to call them vectors um, because they do addition and scan multiplication. So there is a move you can make where you take a couple of vectors and you figure out what all the linear combinations are and you color them all in and you say, that's my set. So if your rule for creating your set is that it's all the linear combinations of the vectors you're thinking of, then that set is called, that action is called spanning. And the set itself is called the span of those things. So if I take two vectors, so if I did this, the span of one, one, three, and zero, one, two, that is all the linear combinations. So anything that I can possibly make with some multiple of this and some multiple of this added together, um, including negative numbers or any, any numbers at all, it's allowed to be all any real number. And I'm allowed, I'm allowed to have zero of this and 15 of that, or I could have 212 of this and minus a half of that, and I could have zero of this and zero of that. That's okay as well. 
any of those linear combinations, all of them together is called the span of those things. And the action of doing that is called spanning. So when I say that, so that's what this is. Now I said that sets um, have these three ways of defining them. The span is this way, is one of these ways. Because when I say the span, it's the set of all things that are something times one, one, three, plus something times zero, one, two. And I'm allowed to use A and B to be any real numbers. This is the long version of this statement here. Not statement, but this noun phrase. Because this is what it means to have all the linear combinations of those things. This is a linear combination. And since I'm using all the A and Bs in R, it's all the linear combinations. What this tells me is how to make sets, points that are in this set. Cool. Yay. That's what span means. I'm going to stop there for a moment and let you um, think and or ask questions. All feeling all right? Cool. So it turns out that the only things you can make from spanning are our favorite sets. Lines and planes and three-dimensional spaces and everything. Things that are made from spanning tend to be flat. Um, and the question is, which of them do you have? So that's what it turns out. So the kind of object that, uh, that the span is, it's not just a set, it's a very special kind of set. And the name for the kind of set that it is, is a subspace. So when you, like, the span of, any vectors at all is a not just a set it's definitely a set it's not just any set it's a subspace and that's our classic subspace is a span so the point of a subspace is it's completely self-contained when you do addition and multiplication uh, scalar multiplication so when you take some things that are already in a subspace and you do a linear combination, then the answer that you produce is still in the subspace. It's impossible to escape by doing linear combinations. Um, and span already does that. If you have the span of some vectors and you combine these together as linear combinations, it just makes even more combinations of the original two. And you made your span to have all of them anyway. So you don't make any new ones because you covered them all to begin with. So, if I had three of this and four of this, and as a separate thing, I had 10 of this and minus six of this, when I combine them, I'll just have 13 of this and minus two of this, and it will be a new one, and we've already got it. That's the idea of what a subspace is. Uh, I'm not going to talk in depth about that right now, but I, I will get there. Um, now, we don't define the definition of, I will do it just saying, the definition of subspace is capital W is a subspace when it's not empty, it has to have actually some vectors in it. Um, and it'll also be guaranteed to have the zero vector in it. And so it's not empty when the zero vector is part of W. So this symbol means um, is a member of, um, and it's the one with the extra line in the middle is designed for object inside set. Um, there's a different symbol for set inside set, um, which is this, just so you know. So that's rule zero. And then um, rule one is, that's rule zero. Rule one is that if there's already a vector in the set, then any multiple of it is in the set as well. And rule number two is if there are two vectors in the set, I'll call them U and V, 
then when you add them, the answer is in the set two. I put them in this order for a reason. Uh, rule zero uses the zero vector. Rule one uses one vector and rule two uses two vectors. That's why I put them in that order because it appeals to me. Um, and if you're going to check whether something's a subspace, it's easier to check them in this order because the zero vector is very easy um, relative to all other vectors. Um, and then it's easier to, to think about whether one vector is in the set than whether a combination of two vectors is in the set. Uh, yeah. So this is the definition of subspace, but the short version is that it's self-contained when you do linear combinations. I put that in a, inverted commas because if you're in your exam and they say, what's a subspace, don't say it's self-contained. That's not fancy enough. This is the fancy version. Um, okay. Okay. So that's what a subspace is. And it turns out that when you start thinking about subspaces, all subspaces are the span of something, which is really cool. No matter what weird ass way you've described your subspace, every subspace can be written as the span of something, even if it's described a different way. The other classic way to make a subspace is to do the solutions of homogeneous linear equations. Um, so, turns out that all subspaces are actually the span of something. So what I mean is that that is, if W is a subspace, then W is the span of something. There is something that goes in this spot that will it will be the span of, definitely. And the point of a basis is, to find what goes in this spot. So if you have a subspace and you want to rewrite it as the span of something, once you've done that, the thing that it's the span of, that's a basis. That's what a basis is for. But there's a, some technical details there that I need to talk about because this isn't good enough to make it a basis. This is kind of like a semi basis <laughs> because some things that go in this spot for span are better than other things. I need this to be the smallest list of vectors as that I can get, and then it would be a basis. I don't want to have too many in there. So I'm just going to stop for a moment to on that train of thought and do a quick example. No, that's not what I want. Just a second. Okay. The span of these three vectors. I would like to think about what shape that is. Like I want to describe it. I know it's in R3. Well, I'm just going to give it a name, W. So W is in or possibly equal to R3 because its vectors have three coordinates. So this symbol means contained in or equal to. So it's a little bit like less than or equal to, but for sets instead of for numbers. Okay, so W is contained in or equal to R3. So since it is a span, the only options for what W could be are a line, a plane, or the whole of R3. That's the only options. That's what spans have to be. 
Well, it could be just the zero vector, but it's not because it's got these things in it. So a line, a plane, or the whole of R3. Yep. The span of things can't be a circle. Because the span of things, I'll show you something. This is a very important question, so I'm just going to pause and talk about it. If I was in, say, R2, and I drew a circle, right? It's a bad circle, but that's my circle. If this was a span, right? Then a span contains all the linear combinations of everything that's in it. So this point and this point are both in the circle, are both part of the circle. And if this was a span, then every combination of these two vectors would also be in the span two. And this vector plus this vector is there. And this vector plus two of this vector is there. So if this circle is part of a span, then everything is part of the span as well. That's why. Um, and also every, you know, if this is in it, then half of it has to be in it. So that bit has to be there too. So yeah, just the edge of a circle. Um, if that's part of a span or a subspace, then the whole thing has to be part of it, or at least the whole plane. Because um, circles just, uh, spans don't have gaps in them. And spans go on forever because of this thing. I'm allowed to have like 500 of each of these and it'll be over there. So how do you feel about that? So yes, a set just generally can be a circle, but a span can't because it's a special kind of set. Okay, so these are my options. I have to decide whether it's a line or a plane or the whole of R3. Okay. Now I do know that it definitely contains the zero vector. And the reason for that is it's the span, which means it has all the combinations. So it has zero of this plus zero of this plus zero of this. So it definitely contains the zero vector. And if I've got something that's a line or a plane or the whole of R3 that contains both the zero vector and this point, then that's going to create an entire line. So here we are in R3. It contains the zero vector and the point one, one, three. And every multiple of this point has to be in this set as well. So half of it and two of it and two thirds of it and minus one of it. And that's going to produce an entire line. So because it definitely contains a zero vector and definitely contains this point, it contains a line. So it's definitely at least a line, but it also contains this point, which is in a whole different direction. So it's definitely more than a line because this point is not one of the multiples of this point. I can't get to here. The only way to get zero in the first coordinate by doing a multiple of this would be to multiply by zero. And I've already got zero, zero, zero. So there, there's too many. So far, we've got at least a plane. How are we feeling about that argument? OK, that idea of saying this one's not contained in the line that this one produces, that, that, that idea is part of the idea of linear independence. This vector and this vector are linearly independent because this one can't be made from that one as a linear combination. That's not the definition of linearly independent, but it is the way that we think about it most of the time. The reason we choose the definition we do, which I'll tell you in a minute, is because um, it's easier to check with a matrix. And there's other reasons. It's easier to do in a proof as well. So the question is, I've got my two, zero, one, two. I've got my two lines. And since I can make anything that's part of these two, I can have, you know, one of this and two of this, which would put me there. And, you know, minus one of this and minus three of this, which would be there. And then minus one of this and four of this, which would be there. I can fill out a whole plane's worth of stuff by doing all the linear combinations of these two. So having something of this plus something of this and zero of this. So the question is, do I get any extra by using this one as well? That's the question. Because if I have any more, if there's another one that's not in this plane, I'm going to have to create everything 
Because if it's not a plane, the only option is the whole of R3. So that's the question. Now, most of this thinking would go on and it would take about 15 seconds. So you don't have to talk, you won't take this long in an exam, but I just need to talk it out. So I need to know if this one's already covered by those two or if it's a new one, that's the question. And that's again, what we mean by linearly independent. These vectors are linearly independent if, the, if each one isn't covered by the ones before by doing linear combinations. But this one is four of this one minus that one. I'm just gonna check that I did the calculations right. <laughs> All right, so if this really was a linear combination of these two, this one here, it would have to be four of that one because there's a zero in this spot here. The only way to make a four in the first coordinate would be to have four of this, this vector. So when I do four of one, one, three, I get four, four, 12. And then the bit that's missing is zero minus one, minus two. Oh, look, that's minus one of zero, one, two. So four, three, 10 is already a linear combination of these two. So including it in this span is really pointless. Like I can, I can make things as a combination of all three of these if I want, but making something out of these two is this, these three is the same as just making something out of just these two. So because this vector is already a linear combination of those two. What that means is the span of the three of them produces the exact same thing as the span of just two of them. And therefore it's a plane, because we already knew that just two of them produces a plane. Through the origin, right? That's some extra information. It does contain the zero vector. So it's not just any plane, it's a plane through the origin. How do we feel about that? You on the Zoom, you're allowed to say things in the chat if you want. So if I was allowed to talk about linear independence, which I am, like, you know, at the very end of the course, we know all the things now. I would have tackled this by saying these three vectors are linearly dependent. Actually, I would have done it exactly this way. I would have said this vector is a linear combination of those, therefore this span is the same as this span. And because these vectors are independent, it's a plane. So I'm just going to step back a bit. You know how I said it's always a line or a plane or the whole of our three? The number of vectors you get once you get the list down as small as possible is the dimension of the thing that you're making. So since this has two independent vectors in its basis, like, so since I'm able to span this with two independent vectors, that means it's a plane because a plane is two dimensional. If I managed to get it down to one, that would be a one dimensional object, that's a line. If, I, if I'd needed three, that would be a three dimensional object. And if I'm in R3, well, that's the whole of R3. R3 is three dimensional. If I was in R4 and I had three dimensional object, that would be just a three space is what I call it. There isn't a word for what that is. We have a word for plane, but we don't have a word for a three dimensional object in 4D. Um, so you would just have to call it a three dimensional space. <laughs> That's why they don't ask you to describe those ones because um, we don't have words for that. Okay, so that idea of being able to of some of them being combinations of the others, that's called linearly dependent. Okay, so it's not the definition, but it is the truth that if any one of them is a linear combination of any of the others, then the whole set is called linearly dependent. Any one is a linear combination of any of the others if 
the whole set is linearly independent, linearly dependent. I know that I just I just felt like I needed to say it and write it down for my own purposes. Not like I'm giving out these notes to you. I'm sorry, but you can always take a photo of it later if you want. Um, that's yeah. We really should try and put these in order. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. Some of the vectors are independent, but because this one is dependent on those two, the whole set's dependent. So the phrase, technically, I'm not allowed to say that these vectors are independent. You say this set of vectors is independent, but the big set of vectors is dependent. Yeah. And that's a very important language point. Um, yeah, but you're right. Linearly dependent sets have within them smaller linearly independent sets usually. And in fact, they have to. You should be able to just throw them one away and keep throwing them away until what you've got left is linearly independent, which is what I did. And in fact, I'm sure that there was an assignment question at some point which says, you know, UVW is independent is dependent is it possible for u and v to be independent and the answer is yes it's totally possible but this is the truth but it's not the definition so the, the linearly independent means that none of them can be written as a linear combination of any of the others um, and that is the truth but it's not the definition and i'll get to the definition in a second but i do want to say a couple of things about this this means that any set that contains the zero vector is automatically dependent because a zero vector can be written as a linear combination of anything you want, because you just go zero of this and zero of this and zero of this. So that's just like in math terminology, you would call that a corollary, as in a thing that you know is true after you said the main thing you were thinking about. Um, so a corollary to this. So this is like a theorem. And this is a corollary any set with zero vector in it is linearly dependent because the zero vector is a linear combination of anything puzzlingly what that means is a set with just the zero vector in it all by itself is linearly dependent all by itself which is puzzling okay now i'm up to the definition The definition of linearly independent is this. If um, so, the set V1, V2, or however many there are up to Vk is linearly depend independent when A1, V1 plus all the way up to A. K, V, K equals zero, that equation, and this is a zero vector, has only the solution A1 equals zero up to A, K equals zero. So this is a linear combination of the vectors. And we're saying that if you want to make a linear combination of the vectors and produce a zero vector, if they're independent, there's exactly one way to do it. And the only way to do it is to have all of these being zero. Now it's totally, no matter which vectors you've got, if you wanna make the zero vector, then you can totally just choose all these to be zero. But for them to be independent, it has to be the only way to do it. There has to be no other way. That's the definition. And the reason why that's chosen as the definition, even though it's easier for us humans to check if one of them is a combination of the others, is that if you can't just see it, this tells you that if you put them as columns in a matrix and row reduce, and you get a pivot in every column, then they're independent. Because this sets up a system of linear equations involving the numbers A1 up to AK, the unknowns A1 up to AK, and the coefficient matrix of that system of linear equations has V1 as a column 
and V2 as a column and up to VK as a column and zeros down here. And if you row reduce this and you get a pivot in every column, then that implies they're linearly independent. But it's not, that's not the definition, it just comes from the definition. The definition tells us a way to use row operations to tell if things are independent. So if you've got some random vectors with numbers in them, quickest way is to do this, especially if you've got a machine that can do row operations for you. If you don't, then it's still all right. And you don't have to go all the way to the reduced rational form. You just have to go far enough to tell how many pivots there's going to be. Um, so that makes it slightly quicker. How are we feeling? Cool. So if I was going to do this like the long way, go back to here. Sorry. If someone asked me, you know, to describe this set, I would know that the options are line, plane, everything. And I would look at it and go, well, these two are independent, so it's at least a plane. So the question is, is this one a combination of those three? But the same, really honestly, the question is just how many linearly independent vectors are in here? Because if there's only one, then it would be a line when I span them. And if there's two, it would be a plane when I span them. And if there's three, it would be the whole of our three when I span them. So I would chuck these as columns in a matrix, row reduce and count the pivots. And that would tell me the dimension of the thing that I'm looking for. That would be the short way of doing it. But if you happen to notice that this one's a combination of those, then, then no row operations are necessary and that's fine. But if you couldn't tell, that's what you'd have to do. We okay with that? You're okay? No, next one behind. You're right. Okay. All right. Cool. So it turns out now that linearly dependent, linear dependence is important to tell what shape your span is going to be. I mean, it's generally flat, but you know, is it a line or a plane or what? Um, so that's why a basis isn't just whatever ends up in this spot where the span is. A basis is a linearly independent set of vectors that ends up in this spot where the span that you're using to span. If independent. That's why the definition of basis has both of those pieces. Because if they're in, if they're linearly dependent, then one of them is already covered by the others. And you don't, if you remove it and you span the other two, you'll get the same thing anyway. And so um, we want to have the shortest possible list. That's what a basis is. But it's really important when you ask yourself what is the basis of this set to, to remind yourself that the goal is to find something that spans first. If you don't have something that spans it, if you, don't, if you haven't rewritten your subspace as a span, then you, you've got no hope. You have to do that first. Yeah. Okay. Oh, final note on linearly independentness. That trick that I did where I did one vector at a time to see if it was a combination of the ones before it in the list, totally a theorem actually. So we know that the definition is this and we know that another thing that is true is that if any one of them is a linear combination of any of the others then that makes it linearly dependent. And if none of them is a linear combination of any of the others and that makes it independent, you don't actually have to check all the possible combinations. You just have to check is this one not the zero vector? Is this one a combination of that one? Is this one a combination of those two? Is this one a combination of the ones before it? So you only have to check each of them with the ones before it in the list, and that will prove it's independent. Um, so there's a theorem for that too. Um, yeah, which is how you actually do it when you're in practice if you're just guessing. Okay. Right. So, oh, one, one final thing. No, no, just gonna do an example. I'm gonna find a basis in two different situations. So, you know how I said there are two different, three different ways to describe a set? Um, the, the list of things. Well, there's only one of those. There's only one vector that is a list of things. 
There's only one set that is a list of things that is a subspace. And it's just the zero vector. So if you have just a list of vectors without span on the front, then it just has these vectors in it. At the moment, this is just three dots. And three dots is not a subspace. Subspaces are always just lines and planes and three dots is not any of those things. So this is not a subspace. If I whack a span in front of it, then it would become a subspace. The only way you can write a list of vectors to make a subspace is to just have the zero vector in it. The zero vector is totally a subspace. You can't escape the zero vector by doing more combinations of the zero vector because the answer is always the zero vector. So the question is for finding a basis of things for, for things that are subspaces is the things that are written this way and the things that are written this way. So the classic way, so W equals, oh, all right, let's, let's just go for it, David. So this set, it's the set of vectors with first coordinate A, second coordinate B plus C, third coordinate 2B minus A, and fourth coordinate C, such that A, B, and C are real numbers. This is a subspace. I know it is, but I can prove it's a subspace, actually. Um, I could use the, the theorem, the, the actual definition, and go through the three, you know, rule zero, that the zero vector's in it, and rule one, that scalar multiples work, and rule two, that addition works. But there's a theorem, we know there's a theorem that says that anything that's a span is definitely a subspace. Um, so I know that this is the same as A lots of one, zero, minus one, zero. There's one A here and no A's here and minus one A's here and no A's here. Plus B lots of zero, one, two, zero. Plus C lots of zero, one, zero, one. And this is a linear combination of these three vectors. And I'm allowed to use all the possible numbers. So therefore it's all the linear combinations of the vectors, which means it's a span. So it is definitely a subspace. The question is, what if I want a basis for this subspace? Well, I would need to know if these three vectors are independent or not. I mean, it's got something that isn't the zero vector, so I know it's not just the zero vector. Um, and I know that this vector and this vector are absolutely not multiples of each other because this one has zeros wherever that one has zeros. Um, so the question is whether this one is a combination of these two. And the only way to make this one as a combination of those two would be to have one of this one and no, none of this one. And one of that one, it's not going to work. But just to be absolutely certain, I'm going to do the matrix thing, if that's okay. Okay, I'm going to row reduce those. So I'm going to check for independence. So technically this zero, 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 no matter what row operations I do, it'll stay exactly at zero, 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 zero. So um, I went wrong with that. So I've already got um, a one here. If I do row three plus row one, that'll give me a zero here. Sweet. And then if I did row two minus two of row one, that'd give me no row two, two of row two, sorry. Row three. Damn it, that's row three. Yeah. <laughs> minus two of row one, that'd give me a zero in that spot. And then if I do row three is row three plus two of row four, that'll give me 
this. And then after that, I'm going to swap row four and row three. All right, I can now tell there is a pivot in every column. And so they're independent. I don't have to finish this off because I know where the pivots are. Therefore, vectors are independent. And so, therefore, these three vectors, they span it. Um, but, um, and they're independent. And so, therefore, it is a basis for W. Now, I haven't actually done the definition of what dimension means. Did I say that? Anyway, the number of vectors you get here is the dimension of the object you've got. So if you've got a basis and it's got three vectors in it, then you say, therefore, W is three-dimensional. In R4. So it's in R4 because the vectors have four coordinates but it's only three dimensional because I only needed three vectors in the basis. There's other stuff in R4 that isn't in W and that's the rest of the four dimensions that, that R4 is made of, but three of them are in, in W. How are we feeling about what happened there? I have a question to ask. What would have happened if this one had been a zero? If that number just there had been a zero? I'm very lucky I can put the whole working on the same screen. They would still have been independent. Yay! Because <laughs> um, there'd still be a zero here, but I'd still get a pivot there. I wonder what else I would need to change in order for their, in order for them to be dependent. That's possibly a fun game that I don't want to play right now. Um, but if I hadn't got a pivot in every column, then um, if I hadn't got a pivot in every column, then it would have only been two dimensional, or possibly less, depending on how many pivots I got. And in fact. Just to, just to be clear, if I had gotten if I had to had the span of these vectors, because this one's a linear combination of those two, um, it doesn't count as part of the basis because I don't need it to create all the rest. So this would have been the basis and it would have been a plane because it's two dimensional. But if when I did the row operations, when I did the row operations, I would have ended up with a pivot in the first column and a pivot in the second column and no pivot in the third column. So the fact there's a pivot here means that that is part of my basis. The fact there's a pivot here means that that is part of my basis and I can remove whichever one doesn't have the pivot. So even if that second one is in the middle, it's still not, like if, you, if I had had something like this, like that, then the original vectors that these came from, that would have been what my basis was. 
yeah, something like that. Just talking about. Of course, I would have known in advance this if this would have been five vectors with four coordinates. I know in advance one of them at least has to be dependent on the others because there's too many of them. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm going to repeat what you said to make sure I understood it. The vectors, the vectors here inside the span don't have to be independent. That is correct. You can put whatever vectors you want in that spot. But to be a basis, they have to be independent. That's what you said. That is also correct. Yeah, that is very excellent summary. Well done. <laughs> very happy you said that. Okay. So if I had something that was the span of five vectors and it produced this when I did the row operations, that would tell me that that subspace has dimension three because it has three pivots, which go back to three vectors from the original that would be my basis. And if you write your vectors in a different order, then you'll get different collection of pivots. And so you end up with a different basis. So here's my second example. I shall call it capital U because I'm sick of using W's today. So X, Y, Z, T um, in R4 such that X minus Y is zero and Y plus two Z minus T is also zero. This set is a set of the form type of object and rule to satisfy. I'm sure there's a word for this, but you know, I can't be bothered trying to look it up or coming up with it, but this is a one that has a rule to satisfy. It, this doesn't currently tell me what any of the vectors in the set actually are. This one back here told me what all the vectors were. I could pick A, Bs and Cs and put them in and it would give me a vector that's in the set. This tells me every vector that's in the set. This doesn't tell me what any of the vectors are, but it does give me a rule to decide if a vector I happen to think of is actually in the set. So that's why it's different. At the moment, I definitely know it's a subspace because the rule for describing it is homogeneous linear equations. So U is a subspace since um, it's the solution to homogeneous linear equations. That's not technically a theorem in your notes, but it is actually there. Um, trust me, you, know, you can go looking for it. There's, an, there's a page with examples of things that are subspaces and one of them is there. So I definitely know it's a subspace. If it had there been like a Y squared here, wouldn't be a subspace um, because that would not be a linear equation. And if this had been equal to six, not be a subspace because it's not a homogeneous linear equation. Okay, so if I want a basis for this subspace, then I, it, I need to rewrite it as a span. Currently, I don't know what any of the vectors are but a basis has to be a span, right? And so I have to rewrite it as a span. So I means I have to solve the equations basically. So I've got X, I've got Y, I've got Z, I've got T, one X minus one Y and no Z's and no T's is zero according to this equation. And no X's and one Y and two Z's and minus one T is zero according to this equation. I have to solve those equations. Notice I've got a matrix with zero on the back. That is the same situation I had before, but it's different because these coefficients came from equations. In the other example, the coefficients came from vectors and the vectors became columns in that matrix. And this one, the equations become rows. The set itself, the vectors themselves are not in this matrix. This vector, this matrix is made of equations. I have to solve it and figure out what to do. Now, I'm going to need there to be two, I'm only gonna be able to fit two pivots in here. So I'm guaranteed to have two free variables. Um, I could do row operations 
in um, the traditional way and put the pivot here. Like there's a pivot here already. And I could put the pivot here and that'd be fine, but I don't have to. Um, if you've, you've done Slack variables and stuff, you've, since you've done the Slack variables thing, you have learned that you can put pivots wherever you want. And so I choose to put the pivot here. So they're my pivots and Y and Z are gonna be my free variables. When I say pivot, I mean a leading one, but I also mean that you're looking for columns of the identity matrix. You wanna find as much of the identity as you can find. And I've found it. I found the identity. And so um, I'm going to say, let Y be equal to uh, P and Z be equal to Q because you're supposed to choose other letters. I could have just used F, Y and Z, but whatever. Um, and so therefore we've got that X minus P is zero and uh, minus P minus two Q plus T is zero. And so I've got that X is P and Y is, and T is, damn it. So X is P and T is P plus two Q. I would use S and T, but I've already got T. So I just thought I'd use P and Q. And so now I've got that X, Y, Z, T as a column is P and Y was also P and Z was Q and T was P plus two Q. Which means that this is P lots of one, one, zero, one and Q lots of zero, zero, one, two. So every vector that is in U is writable in this way. And so therefore U is actually now the span of one, one, zero, one, and zero, zero, one, two. You notice I've been sloppy about whether they are columns or rows. Um, eh, whatever. The original set, it was a row. So I prefer to write it as a row when I get to the end, but I have to write them as columns to do the matrix stuff. And those two vectors are independent because this one's not a multiple of that one. And so therefore, um, it's my basis. And therefore, U is a plane in R4 because it's two dimensional. You know. U has dimension. Two. So the place where the vectors are has dimension four because there's four coordinates, but the vectors in U themselves together, that U is a two dimensional object. When I color in all those points, it's a plane, which is two dimensional. Right, I think I would like to move on from the linear independence and basis and stuff. Um, but I will keep talking about it if people want me to. So feel free to ask a question. Cool. All right. There you go. I hope that was helpful. Um, yeah. I love subspaces. Um, cool. Is anyone brave enough to say one thing that happened then in that last hour and quarter that they would like to reuse in the future? Uh, correct, Eugene. It is a basis if the vectors in the set that, you, that creates the span is linearly independent. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's awesome. I like that process too. Um, chucking out, for, for those who are online, um, the, that, that process of, if you find a vector in, if you've got a span of things and you find a vector in there that's a combination of the others, you can throw it out and keep doing that until you've got the smallest thing left and then that's a basis. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Um, I will say something. If you just have a set of linearly independent vectors, then they'll span something and they will definitely be a basis for whatever it is that they span. Um, the question, if you say, if someone gives you a subspace and says, is this a basis for it? Um, they have to be independent. Um, they, and they're going to span something. The question is, do they span the object you're thinking of? So they actually have to be in the set if they're going to be a basis for it. That's secret rule zero is your vectors have to be in the set if they're going to be a basis for the set. If they're not in the set, there'll be a basis for something. It just won't be the set you were thinking of. Subspace. I mean, subspaces are sets. Okay. Awesome. That was very happy with that. Much better than the, the statistics and numerical methods two seminar I did yesterday. Um, okay. So I'm going to deal with this. Uh, I don't know what this means. So um, is the person who sent me an email saying some notation for matrices actually here? All right, then I don't know what it means. So I'm, I'm gonna have to um, can that and hopefully they'll turn up at some point and let me know. Um, yeah. Yep. I think there's a bit right when they do the matrix multiplication where they write it as some notation. And maybe that's what they're talking about. Okay. All right. But some notation in particular seems like it's a bit, a bit of a weird ass thing that people are worried about. Um, but using it for integrals <laughs> is tricky too. All right. Okay, I might even talk about that. Um, most semesters I do trig substitution and there's lots of videos on it. So I might come back to that if I have time. I might talk about some notation and hopefully um, cover whatever that person was asking about. Mm -hmm. I have real trouble remembering things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's technically somewhere in the notes. Um, I prefer to do it with, I prefer to do it with, um, a fine, look at the trig identity that's most similar to what I've got and then run with that. Cause I'm gonna have to use a trig identity. Look, we're talking about it now. Okay, we're talking about it now. So um, a trig substitution. Um, is a very fancy kind of substitution. Um, and it's specifically designed to deal with things that look like they would have come from Pythagoras' theorem. So um, when you have a triangle um, and you have like a number here, I don't want to use an A, but I'll just do it with an example. If you have like a number here and an X here, then this side will be the square root of X squared plus two squared. Um, and but if you have a triangle like this, then this side will be the square root of x squared minus 2 squared. And if you have a triangle like this, then this side will be the square root of 2 squared minus x squared. So these sorts of things come about when you're trying to solve things using Pythagoras' theorem. And those things being in an integral is what trig substitution is designed for. Um, okay. And the reason it's helpful is that we don't know how to do integrals that look like this, but if we chuck some trig identities in, um, then we can turn it into something involving trigonometry, which may sound harder, but hard is better than impossible. Um, and so that's the idea of trig substitution. 
Uh, and it tends to cause you to, find, to create integrals that have trig things in them, and you need separate ways of dealing with trig as well in order to do them. And then you have to put the x's back and like, it's just a complicated thing. Uh, but it is, I mean, technically, if you know something's impossible, you can just say, that's impossible, I can't do it, and you can just stop. Um, but since you know it is technically possible, if you do this, that's better than impossible. So all trig identities run by, sorry, all trig substitutions run by working with trig identities. And so for me, the easiest way of making them work is to create the trig identity I'm aiming for eventually. So if I saw something with, with that in it, um, I would first check to see if I can do it with ordinary substitution. So ordinary substitution, I'd probably call this U and then I'd get like a DU on DX and that would have a two X in it because of the X squared. And I'd need there to be an X there already um, or I wouldn't be able to do the substitution properly because I'd need to find an X DX and there is not an X here. So I'm not gonna be able to do this with ordinary substitution, but that's the first thing you should check. Because if it was this, then I would do u equals 16 minus x squared, du on dx is minus 2x. And so minus a half of du is x dx. And this x dx here would become that x dx becomes minus a half of du. That becomes a u. And so I get. And that I can do because it's a power. So the, the minus a half will still be there because it's multiplied on. U to the power of a half is, uh, power goes up by one to one and a half, which is three on two. And I divide by the new power, which would be the same as multiplying by two thirds. And so I get minus a third of U to the three on two plus C, which is minus a third of 16 minus X squared to the three on two plus C. That, is an ordinary substitution, classic. And I knew I could do it because the thing that I, the, the X's out here when they attach the DX reminded me of the derivative of the thing here. But if that X isn't there, we're not gonna be able to do this move here. And so we would have to do something else. And what we would like to do is get rid of that square root because that's the annoying thing. Because if that square root wasn't there, we'd totally just be able to do it. You know, power up by one, divide by new power, yay. Um, so it's the square root that's a problem. So if we could turn this into something that's already squared, then the square root and the square would cancel each other out and we'd be really happy. And that looks like a trig identity, right? So if I had like cos of u squared plus sine of u squared, that would be one. And look, those variable squared plus variable squared equals one. What we have here is number minus variable squared. That's cool. I can arrange that. Number minus variable squared. That's what this looks like. Cool. But I don't have a one in this spot here. I've got a 16. So it just times everything by 16. And now it's really similar. If this was x squared, I'd be good. And if that's gonna be x squared, uh, that's gonna require me to have x being four sine u. Sweet. So I'm gonna go back here and put it in. Let x be equal to four sine u. And then, this is 16 minus x squared. Cool, huh? That's how I do it because, you know, whatever. You can do it with triangles as well. But that's how I make the decision because I know I'm going to have to do the trig identities anyway. And so when I do the square root of both sides, I get that 4 cos of u is the square root of 16 minus x squared. Sweet. Technically, I'm supposed to choose my use so that this is guaranteed to be positive. Um, so that's all right. 
like as long as I choose them in the domain of where cos is positive, would it be fine? Cool. And so now um, when you do substitution, I've dealt with this bit, that's four cos, you're gonna to have to deal with the dx as well. So So dx is four cos u du. So now when I look at my original integral, this bit I have found it's here and that's four cos u. And this bit I have found it's here and it's four cos u du. And so that means I can replace every piece of my integral now with something involving u. Your lecturer probably uses theta, don't they? Yeah, I just like using u for substitution. And my theta's look crap because I write my o's backwards. So um, yeah, look at this. I try and write theta for you. Like it's just stupid. So anyway. <laughs> okay, and so my integral of root 16 minus x squared dx is that bit was four cos u and the dx was four cos u du. Sweet. And so now I have the integral of 16 cos u squared du, which is awesome because I totally know how to do that integral. Do you? <laughs> but do you? Ah, yeah, you, yeah. Over in the USA, they call it U substitution, um, which is weird because you don't have to use the letter U. It's just tradition. Like you could just as easily use T or theta or anything you want. So anyway. Um, right, I have to do this not by substitution because um, I've already done a substitution. Technically, it's not impossible to do two substitutions, but if you can do two substitutions, then you can usually do one if you want. So I have to do this by a different method. And substitution is method two on the list. Like the first, zero, method zero is just do it because you know the answer already. And method one is rewrite it. And method two is substitution. And then method three is integration by parts. And then method four is, um, is trig substitution. And we're in the middle of trig substitution. So we have to go right back to the beginning. And if we're not going to do substitution, we have to re rewrite it. We have to find a way of rewriting this in a way that means that we can do it. And if you're going to rewrite something involving a trig, then that's what trig identities are for. We need a trig identity that involves cos squared that it will turn it into something that we do know. <sighs> okay, well, we already used this one that involves cos squared. So we're going to need a different one. Um, the cos double angle formula has a cos squared in it. Cos of 2u is cos u squared minus sine u squared. That's got a cos squared. And if I replace this sine squared with 1 minus cos squared, then I'm going to get two of them. Like that. Yay. Oh, my computer's just about to run out of battery. Just give me a second. Okay. So there's my cos squared. So two cos u squared is cos of two u plus one, according to this. But I don't have two of them. I've got 16 of them. So I have to times by eight. And this I do know how to integrate because when there's just a constant times the variable on the inside of your function, you just divide by that constant along the way. So this I can do. So my integral is now this is now eight cos of two u plus eight. So this bit, the eight will still be there because it's multiplied on. The integral of cos is sine 
but because it's a 2u instead of a u, I'll have to divide by 2 as well. And then the integral of 8 is 8u. So we're doing really well. But my original function um, had x's, so I'm going to have to put them back. Oh, crap. I'm going to go back to where I did the substitution and see if I can find um, sine to you and you. Nope, got lots of cos u's. I do, um, I've got a sine u, but not a sine to you. I guess if I rearrange that, I can figure out what u is. So that's a good start. So let's start there. Okay, so x is 4 sine u. So x over 4 is sine u. So therefore, arc sine of x on 4 is u. All right, cool. I know what the u is. That's good. And this is great because if u has to be arc sine, then the answers that come out of arc sine happen to be the same inputs that go into cos that make it positive. So it all works out. Yay. It's almost as if we set it up that way. So, yeah, that's nice. So technically, you're supposed to start your substitution here, um, but whatever. All right, so it deals with that u, but I do not like the idea of putting two arc sine of x on u in this spot and then doing sine of that. because like, what? That's okay. Trig identities to the rescue. Sine of 2u is 2 of sine u cos u. And I just wrote down what sine u was. It's x on 4. And earlier, I wrote down what cos u was. It was, it was, here it is, a quarter of the square root of 16 minus x squared. It's just there. And so therefore, my integral is now, so that would be, what would that be? Just a second. One eighth of x sixteen minus x squared. Okay, so therefore my integral of sixteen minus x squared dx is actually one uh, a cram it four times one eighth of x root sixteen minus x squared plus eight of arc sine of x on u x on four plus c. Ah, oh. that's trig substitution. You'll notice there were a lot of bits, a lot happening, but each of the pieces was the same as the pieces that you do in an ordinary substitution, but just harder. So when you do an ordinary substitution, you pick your substitution, and then you do some work to try and replace each bit of the integral, including the dx, with something involving u or whatever your letter is. And that's what this bit here was. Let me just, yeah. And then you do the bit where you replace them. And then you do the bit where you figure out how to do this integral. And that's what this bit here is. And then you do the bit where you put the x's back. And that's what this bit here is. And a really important point. And one of the reasons that I do this the way I do is that when you get to this end bit and you're looking at what you've got, you can find the bits you need back here. Yeah. So there you go. Um, so in general, your, your um, trig substitution requires you to use trig identities three times. Once to choose the substitution, once to do the integral, and wants to get your x's back. Doesn't always happen that way, but it's usual. How do you feel about that example? So I have trouble remembering just, so some people look at this and they just remember that it's supposed to be four sine u. And I just can't remember that. 
but I have to do this working anyway, so I might as well just do it and then it'll tell me what the answer is. Yeah. Other people like to use a triangle, which is actually a useful thing as well. So some people prefer to do this. And they go, well, all right, well, this is supposed to come from Pythagoras' theorem. And since it's a minus, this is one of the short sides. And so is X, because it was the one that was taken off. So that's a short side as well. And the long side must be four, so that four squared minus X squared is 16 minus X squared. So that's the triangle that it would have come from if it fit inside a triangle. And what I would like to do is choose my trig substitution in such a way um, that I get sine or cos or something. So your angle has to be one of these two angles. Um, and then if I choose it to be this one, then sine of u will be x on four. And that's much simpler than doing cos because cos produces minuses when you do the integrals and stuff. So that would be that sine of u is x on four. And cos of u is now uh, root 16 minus x squared on four and not that we need it, tan of u is um, this divided by this. Yeah. And so that means that we now have that this is four cos u from the triangle, which is slightly shorter than what I did before. Yeah. Um, and but you still have to do the dx bit in order to be able to finish this off. But then when I get to the very end, so the middle of it's the same, when I get to the very end and I get to here, and I get my sine to u here, I still have to use a trig identity, turn that into two sine u cos u, but then I've already got sine u and cos u in my diagram. So lots of people like to use this diagram as their way of doing trig substitution instead of writing out all of, all of this stuff, which is, I can see why, because it's shorter, but yeah, my story memory is better than my picture memory. And so I, I remember this story better. So, yeah, but yours might work differently. And so run with whatever works for you. Questions, thoughts? Cool. As I said, lots of seminars on, on trig substitution if you want to see other things that I've said about it in past years. Okay. Oh, yay. Done this. Let's do some stuff on some notation. Um, all right. An upper and lower sum, eh? That's what you were talking about for doing integrals. That'll, that'll cover everything we want to cover. So 20 minutes and I can go over. So I'll just keep recording, even if you have to leave. Um, you do have to eat at some point, but I'll, I'll see how I go. <laughs> Maybe I'll have some water now. Okay. So. Individuals using sums. It's just easier to do an example. Just give me a second. Why not? Can I just check something about your exam? How is it running? Like, is there, is there a bit that's like Mobius test and then there's a written bit or is it all written or what? Okay, all written? Okay. Just good to know. They've, they've been playing around with how to do exams for the last couple of years, so it's different every semester. Okay, but then you still have to upload the thing, like yeah, which is the, the annoying bit. Okay, good, good, just making sure. 
So sorry, I'm going to find this integral using upper and lower sums. It's probably going to be very hard, but right. So just let me talk a little bit about the upper and lower sums concept. Um, integration um, and differentiation were invented separately. Um, and only later did they discover that they were related. Um, and we live at this end of history several hundred years later, um, knowing that to do an integral, we can find do the opposite of differentiation and subtract the two things and yay, it's lovely. Um, but before that, they didn't really know how they were connected. It didn't take them that long. I mean, Newton's pretty clever, but um, still mathematicians really like to know that everything really does properly work properly. And so they like to have a definition of integration that doesn't use differentiation. And so our definition of integration, like integration is an accumulation of a quantity across space. And so you accumulate this quantity and you take into account how long it spends being each value and then you add that all up. And so you end up, essentially it's an area, but areas below the x-axis have to count as negative. Um, and that's great. But the way that we define it is we say, well, something that's this shape, I know what its area is because it's just the width times the height. And that's great. So what I'm gonna do is any function, I mean, this one's not that shape, it's a parabola, but any function, if I cut it into pieces and I say, well, it's definitely less than this rectangle and more than this rectangle, and it's less than this rectangle and more than this rectangle, and it's less than this rectangle and more than this rectangle, then at least you'll be able to say whatever the proper integral is, it's somewhere between here and here. Um, and that's the way we're doing it. And if we cut these into small enough pieces, then the two answers you get for the, the, the upper area and the lower area will be really close together and the true integral will be somewhere in between. And as long as you can make them as close together as you like, then the integral really exists. Some functions which are extremely crazy um, and tend to be ones that are like defined separately on the rationals versus the irrationals. Um, those kinds of functions, the upper sum and the lower sum are, never get any closer than a certain amount. And there's this whole range of numbers between where you go, any of them could be the integral and I don't know which one, so there is no integral. But quadratics are great, like they're nice smooth lines, we can, we can do it. So what we're gonna have to do, aha, uh -huh, just a second. No, that's answering my previous question. Um, so we're gonna have to cut it into pieces. It doesn't actually matter if the pieces are all equally spaced. It's just easier to do. Um, as long as, if you can find two different arranged cutting ups that, that get you within a certain distance, then you can approximate it to have whatever level of accuracy you want. And some functions it's easier, like L, um, one over X, for example, it's easier to have thin ones at the beginning and fat ones at the end. But for the purposes of doing, up, doing this, it's easier if they're all the same width. And so that's what we're gonna do. There you go, that's the story. Now you can just probably forget all that if you want. But um, just know if you ever study real analysis two in second year, then you will do them with not all the same width as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So what we have to do is we have to cut this interval into um, equal pieces. And then we're going to change how many pieces we cut it into and, and figure out what happens as the number of pieces gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what we're going to do. But the very first step before we do anything is to cut it into n equal intervals. So that's not really part of the actual thing here. So divide the interval from two to seven into n equal sub intervals. You notice the words, the, the prefix sub there. Sub is what mathematicians use for a thing that's inside another thing. Subspace is a space inside a bigger space. A sub interval is an interval inside a bigger interval. Okay. So um, n equals sub intervals. And in order to do that, we're gonna to need to find out where the edges of all those sub intervals are. But the picture in my head is that here's two and here's seven, and there's all these little things here. And there's n gaps. And so what I'm gonna to need to do is I'm gonna to to take the entire width, which is five. Um, and then the width of each interval Sub interval, that's my sub abbreviation for sub interval, is traditionally called delta x because this is an x axis and it's a gap in the axis, a change in x. And it is the total width divided by the number of intervals I cut it into. 
Sweet. And the reason I need to know that is I need to know how wide these gaps are to figure out what all the endpoints of the intervals are. All right, here we go. So if I want to get to the end of interval number I, if I'm counting which interval I'm up to, interval one, interval two, interval three, interval four, interval five, if I want to get to the end of interval number I, I'm going to have to start at two and add on I lots of this width, and then that will get me to the end of interval number I. Because the interval number one is one interval away, the end of interval number two is two intervals away. So um, the right hand end of in sub interval number I is traditionally called xi and it is two plus i lots of the delta x because that's what i did started at two and i did i lots of delta x and here i am at the end of interval number i which is two plus five so delta x is five on n and i've multiplied it by i and i've gotten that and the left hand end of sub interval number i is one step before that. The left hand end of subinterval number i is the right hand end of subinterval number i minus one. It's the this end is the this left hand end is the right hand end of the previous interval. So that would be two plus five times i minus one on n. And I don't have to um I will I choose whoa. I choose not to expand that out. Cool. This is, all of this is step zero. Like it's the thing we have to do before we even start. But what I have done is I have found what all the sub intervals are. And you'll notice, hopefully, that this has absolutely nothing to do with the actual function that's in this spot. So far, I've only used this information to create what I've done here. So even if my, my lovely friend um, in, who writes my exam hadn't told me what this function was and I just put f of x in there, I could still do this part. Okay. The next step is we need to figure out where the maximum and where the minimum is on every interval. So this was, this was step zero, which was find the interval, or step one. Find the sub-intervals. The next step is to find where the maximum and minimum is on every sub-interval. Sometimes, for some functions, sometimes the maximum is on the left hand side, sometimes it's on the right hand side, and they are extremely difficult and we're not going to, you're not going to be given questions that have that problem. Okay, it's always going to be that the maximum is at, always at the same end of every interval. But we need to figure out which end it's at. So this has two, two smaller pieces this step. First, you have to figure out which end they're at, and then you have to figure out what the actual maximum is. So to do that, I'm going to need to figure out whether this function is increasing or decreasing on this domain. All right. Uh, X squared plus 5X minus 7. Uh, let me call it F of X. Yes, that's a good move. F of X is that. Um, it's a parabola. It's facing upwards. Uh, and the vertex is at x equals minus b on 2a. Okay, so the vertex is over here at minus 5 on 2, and my interval is from 2 to 7. So my parabola is going to have to be increasing over here because it goes down to there and then it goes back up again. Okay, cool. Therefore, f of x is increasing. The vertex is there, and the orientation is this way up. Now, you can use whatever method you like to figure out um, whether your function is increasing. Because it's a parabola, I know how to do it. And if you have a machine that can graph it for you, you just graph it, and then you'll know. Um, and if it's a straight line, it's even easier because you've got the slope. Um, 
Yeah. If my interval had been over this side, then it would have been decreasing because it's a parabola. So it's down on this side, up on this side. So f of x is increasing. So since my function is increasing on every interval, the minimum will be on the left-hand side and the maximum will be on the right-hand side. Therefore, on sub-interval number i, the minimum is at the left-hand end and the maximum is at the right-hand end. Awesome. Just as a little diagram for myself, here is xi minus 1, which is the left-hand end. Here is xi. This is sub-interval number i. And the maximum is here, and the minimum is here. But if it was a decreasing function, they would have been the other way around. Now, I'm just saying it is here. Xi minus 1 isn't the minimum. It's just the place where the minimum is. The minimum is the y value. So we're going to have to figure that out. How are we feeling? All right, cool. All right, so. Um, um, so the minimum value on sub interval number i is usually called little m i. And the maximum is capital M i. And it will be f of the left hand end. So in our case, f of x i minus one. So my function was x squared plus 5x minus 7. So that will be, I've made it smart, hard, hard for myself. Uh, so it'll be x squared, x squared plus 5 times x minus 7. And xi minus 1 is here. And I choose not to do any more at this time than that. The maximum value on subinterval number i is capital M i, which is f of the right hand end. Yes, the maximum's here at xi, which was x squared plus 5 times x minus. And that was 2 plus 5i on n. And that was 2. OK. So I have to look at these and decide which of them is going to be easier. And the answer is this one, because that one's got a brackets within brackets, and it's even harder. So I'm going to do this one. This is easier. So whichever of them has the i and not the i minus 1, that's the one that you do. So if the minimum has the xi, you'll do that one first. If the maximum has the xi, you'll do that one first. You do whichever one has the xi and not the xi minus one, because it's easier that way. So since I've chosen to do this one, I'm going to um, actually expand this out. <sighs> so four plus two times two times five i on n plus 25 i squared on n squared plus 10 plus 25 i on n minus 7. Okay, so 4 plus 10 minus 7 is 7. And I've got uh, 4 times 5i, which is 20i on n, and 25i on n, so I've got 45i on n. And then I also have 25i squared on n squared. That's what capital M i is. Right, so that's the end of step two. I have found the maximum and I chose not to find the minimum because it was too hard. How are we feeling? Cool. Here we go. Next step. Find the upper sum or the lower sum if you, so because I found, no, or LN. Because I've done the maximum, I'm going to find the upper sum first. If I'd done the minimum in this spot, I would have found the lower sum first. So 
So the upper sum is the sum across all the intervals from interval number one up to interval number n of the width times the maximum value. These are all those rectangles, the width times the maximum. And I add all those rectangles areas up and that's the upper sum. And I know for certain that the integral will be less than whatever this number is. Now, delta x, um, the del that delta x is the same no matter what n is. So I can actually do this if I want. Sorry, that delta x is the same no matter what i is. Doesn't matter which interval I, I'm at, that delta x is always the same. So multiplying them all by delta x uh, and then adding is the same as adding them and then multiplying by delta x. It's the distributive law. All right, my delta x is, uh, where's my delta x? Five on n. And my capital M I is seven plus 45 I on N plus 25 I squared on N squared. Now I'm up to the point where I have to use the sum notation. The laws of sum notation say that if I have three bits added together, then I can do the sums of each bit separately and add them together afterwards. So this is the same as this. Like that. So it's almost like you're distributing this across there, but technically you're actually distributing the other way around, but it's all good. All right. All right. And I'm just going to leave that seven there for a minute. This one has 45 on n times i, and that 45 on n is a number that's multiplied by every bit separately. And so I can do the same trick I did with the delta x. And the 25 on n squared can do the same trick. Many people experience with some notation will do this step in one step instead of in two. So it goes straight from here to here. They'll bring the sum in and go, oh, I can bring that out and they'll do it all at once. Just so you know, and that's okay to do. All right, here we go. I have n sevens that I've added together which is therefore n times seven, because that's how many sevens I've added. So that is seven n. And here there is a formula for what the sum from one to n of i is. That formula is <clears throat> n squared on two plus n on two. Uh, most people probably remember it as a half of n times n plus one. Um, that's an alternative version of it. It doesn't really matter. And so you could do that as well if you wanted. And then the sum of i squared also has a formula. And that formula is this. So it has an n and an n squared and an n cubed. And the n cubed is on three and the n squared is on two and the n is on six, which is two times three. And that's exactly how I remember it. There's a factorized version of that too, but I can never remember what that is. I can remember this. And now we've neatly gotten rid of all our sum signs. So from this point, it's just inverted commas, algebra. Uh, that was algebra too, but you know, it's some notation algebra. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do um, is, I'll leave that there for a second. So I've got those ends divide each other away and I've got 45 on two N plus 45 on two, cause that can come in. And then, um, all right, I've got 25 on six, lots of one on N from the N on N squared. And I've got 25 on two lots of one cause N squared divided by N squared is one plus 25 on three lots of n because n squared divided n cubed divided by n squared is n. Okay. 
what you want to do is get all separate all your n's and n squares and stuff. That's that's the point plan. I'm very unhappy. This is not working the way I should. I don't like this one on end here. Give me a second. No, this is on in. No, it's not. Sorry. Ignore that. No, it's all right. Everything's fine. Okay. Sorry. I was worried about the ends on the bottom. The ends not going to zero. It's going to infinity and that's fine. Okay. Right. And uh, zero on the bottom is bad, but you know, infinity on the bottom is great because one divided by infinity is zero. Um, so I'm all good. So I've got um, seven N and then a 45 on two and uh, seven on two would be, uh, four, seven would be 14 on two. 14, oh crap. It is some, it is this number. That many ends. So that's this one and this one and this one. Uh, and then I've got, uh, that I can do. 45 plus 25 is 70 on two. And then I've got a 25 on six times one on n. Okay, just combining them all together. And now I'll do the five on n. So I've got five times seven plus 45 on two plus 25 on three times n, dividing by n times by n, they'll go away. And then I've got five times, hey, that's 35, yay, um, on n. And then I've got 125 on six n squared. So this five on n has attached itself to all three of these pieces. And here I am. That's the upper sum. I actually know what the answer for the interval is now. It's whatever this number is. Because as the number of intervals gets bigger and bigger, you know, whatever this is divided by like a million would be nearly zero. And this divided by a million squared would be nearly zero as well. And so the inter the, we know that the upper sum gets closer and closer and closer to the correct answer. And so this must be what the correct answer is. We know already that that's, that's the answer. But if we're going to be completely rigorous about it, we have to be absolutely certain that the integral really, really exists, which means we need to know that the lower sum gets closer to the same answer. So that's what we're going to have to do. All right, here we go. This is my last step. I mean, you don't need to do this if you're going to write it down to yourself and just find any other one. So I'm not going to use much sum notation to do this, but I am going to write this down. The lower sum is the sum from i equals 1 to n of delta x times the minimum on each interval. And the minimum was f of x i minus 1, right? Now the upper sum, in fact, just to make my working even clearer, this is delta x times i equals 1 to n of um, f of x i back here. That's what we got when we did the maximum. The minimum's got i minus 1. They're almost exactly the same. It's just that the minimum is using the numbers one step earlier than the maximum because the ma minimum of this interval is the maximum of the previous interval because the function's increasing. So that's the idea here is that here we are on interval number i and that's its minimum and interval number i minus one, that's its maximum. Cool, huh? So I'm gonna do a trick. If this i goes from one to n, then these numbers go from zero to n minus one. And so this is really, this. I can use i in this spot and instead use the numbers from n, what, 0 to n minus 1 and I'll get the same list of numbers as I had before. This is one of your manipulation tools for sums is that you can you can subtract something from both of these and add it there and it'll all work out to the same answer. Very cool sum manipulation trick. 
And this is almost the same as the upper sum. But the upper sum goes from one to n, whereas this one goes from zero to n minus one. So if I wanted this to be related to the upper sum, it's the same as the upper sum. Except it doesn't have the one for zero. So we'll take off um, delta x f of zero, f of x zero. Crap, no, we'll add that in. Damn it. I was wrong. This one doesn't have the one for zero. So it's going to be the same as this. We're going to have to add in the delta x f of x zero. And it, this one has the n, and we don't really want that there. So we'll take that off like that. And this is the upper sum, which we just calculated. And this is five on n times f of x zero is the very left-hand end of the whole interval, which is two. And this is the upper sum. And this is um, five on n times f of the other very end of the interval, which is seven. Ta-da! How are you feeling about what just happened? Yep. Oh, I, what's the significance of the negative delta x, the second negative? Oh, the, the one above. That's, that's yeah. So that's delta x f of x sub n. Oh, okay. And this is x sub zero. Yeah. And so, that's a five on n, sorry, not a five on two. So this is going to be un, which is five times seven plus 45 on two plus 25 on three plus five times 35 on n plus 125 on n squared plus five on n times whatever f of two is minus five on n times whatever f of seven is. And if I really wanted to, I could calculate those numbers by subbing them into the formula. But not oh, n, damn it, five on n. Okay. The point is that all of these have an n on the bottom, so they'll all go to zero anyway, regardless. So therefore, ln goes to five times seven plus 45 on two plus 25 on three. And un goes to five times seven plus 45 on two plus 25 on three. And the integral from two to seven of x squared plus 5x minus 7 dx is between them. And so therefore the integral must be this answer. Yay. Whatever that is. I mean, that's what calculated the four. It's going to be bad because it's got a, a third in it somewhere, but you know. No, just 25. How are you feeling? Uh, how's everybody feeling about that? Is there a bit of that that you think, hmm, I'm not sure I could do that um, in a stressful situation? Which bit's that? This bit here. It's a lot to Sorry? Yes, please, please do in a minute before you go. Um, yes. Um, it is less to keep track of than you think. When you look at all of it, you go, wow, but I'm only doing one piece at a time. Definitely starting with this and then replacing this with what I thought it was and then going, okay, I know what the rules are for addition, I can do that. I know what the rules are for pulling it out, I can do that. I'm supposed to remember what these are, that's the trickiest part. Um, that's the, when I say tricky, it's just like tricky like quitting smoking because there's not like any steps to take, you just have to know. <laughs> um, yeah, you just have to know those. Um, and then this is algebra, but this is an exam, it's a written exam. It's not like you've just got a box to enter a number. So you will get marks for every piece of that you do. 
So even if you can't finish any one of the pieces, you can at least get to the point where you need to get to. And you can even say, I don't have time to finish this, but this is the steps that's coming after. And say, after this point, I will find LN using this process. Because this will be, this bit's the same no matter what. Um, so don't forget that you don't, if you don't have time, you can still actually do some of the work, um, even if you can't finish all the pieces. Um, you need to include all the reasoning that you would think there'd be marked for, including even if you can't finish this, you could say, I know that this will come out to be a number plus some number on n and some number on n squared. And, there, and whatever number that is will be the integral. And then you've at least proven you know something and it might make all the difference between one grade band and another. <laughs> um, so prove you know what, the, what the, the structure is like, even if you don't get time to do it, is what I'd say. And that's why I gave them names for the pieces so that you could say, well, these are the pieces that I would be doing because then at least they'll know. So technically this last bit is a separate piece find the integral. Yeah. So that's just some advice for dealing with the situation where you go, crap, I don't know what to do now. Know the wider structure. And it's just like with the trig substitution, you know there's several pieces involved. So even if you don't get to do them, you can at least prove that you know what they are. And it might give you a mark when you wouldn't have got one at all. So you should always do that sort of thing. Yeah. Cool. So just so you know, the rules of some notation that I've used there, I just want to talk about them just so that you can see where they are. There's a whole separate seminar where I go through just what the rules of some notation are, but they all used during one of these problems. So one of them was this, that you can pull out a number if it doesn't involve the, the I or the whatever this letter here is. If it doesn't involve it, you can pull it out the front. There was one here where the sum of three things added can be the three separate pieces. There was the formulas for these specific ones. And there was this move where you can shift the index over. It's literally called index shifting. That's, that's what people call it. And there's this move where if you've got a sum and another sum that's got exactly the same, but using different numbers, you can add and subtract bits to make them work. And they're all rules of some notation that are attested in the Mobiuses. So, yeah, and that's one of the reasons to teach them. One of the reasons to teach upper and lower sums is so that you learn how to use some notation. And the other one is just, just philosophy of mathematics. And it's like, yeah, this is what an integral really is. Um, yeah. And also just makes you really grateful that you don't have to do any rules this way. Yeah, because we know what the answer actually is. It's actually, we can probably see it. So we've got an X cubed on three. That's coming, that's where the 20, that's where the on three and the 25 came from. And there's an X squared on two. And look, there's an on two here. And there's a seven X, which is here. Um, and then it's all multiplied by five because of other things. So yeah. So those numbers, those thirds and halves are coming about because of the square x cubed and x squared. And when integration was invented, that was the things that, that Newton noticed, that when you integrate x squared using his method of you know, adding up rectangles, it came out to be x cubed on three. And he went, oh, that's, that's cool. Let's run with that instead. So, yeah. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. And um, I will stop the recording.